Welcome to Alabama Short Stories, when you're a little behind on your Alabama history. I'm your host, Sean Wright. Not only do we get radio from towers located around the state, but we can also now get it from satellites. We can also get a form of radio as podcasts, which you download to your phone or electronic device to listen to at your leisure. Some may argue that podcasts are not radio at all, but we can all agree that radio has been around all our lives. In Alabama, it started almost 100 years ago. There were very few companies in the early 1920s that had any experience with the high-powered electricity it took to build and run a radio station. If it was going to get done, Alabama Power was going to have to do it. Now, the original purpose of an Alabama Power radio station was not to provide entertainment to the citizens of Alabama. It was intended to keep in touch with line crews in isolated areas around the state, to send them information, weather forecast, whatever they needed. One of the first visitors to the new studio was Alabama President Thomas Martin. He gave a short four-minute talk and then with tongue firmly planted in cheek spoke to the thousands of listeners. Martin was a big supporter of the radio station. If the name Martin rings a bell, Lake Martin and Martin Dam are named in his honor. It took a while for the studio to be constructed, and they would do test broadcast every day while they dialed in the settings. They would broadcast something like, Hello Jones, hello Gadsden, Mary Mary Quite Contrary, 1, 2, 3, 4, How Do You Like the Sound, etc, etc. Soon after, Letters started coming in faster and faster from locations outside of Alabama, such as Florida, New York, Michigan, Kansas, and Oklahoma. The publicity department saw a new opportunity and got busy, working out the programs and booking bands for a full-fledged radio station. If you've got the equipment and the public is interested in this new technology, why not broadcast some entertainment for their pleasure? Back before the airwaves were littered with thousands of radio and television stations, Wi-Fi and cell service, a broadcast station could be heard for miles, thousands of miles even. WSY managers believed that their signal could be heard for 500 miles, but if the atmosphere cooperated, it could go three or four times that far. There were only about 250 radio stations or so in 1922, and the programs could be picked up from almost anywhere. Receiving the programs was great for people who lived out in the country. People who were too far to get same-day newspaper delivery could be up-to-date on current events. And even those without electricity could benefit. Most radios at the time were built from kits, and they ran on batteries. Now, the WSY studio was located at 1921 Powell Avenue by the Powell Steam Plant. There were two rooms. One had the broadcast equipment, and the other was a studio or concert room that had a sofa, a piano, Victrola, and a radio phone, a large microphone mounted on a wooden stand. During the testing, Dr. Courtney Shropshire chartered the Vicksburg chapter of the Civitan Club, a volunteer club that Dr. Shropshire had started in Birmingham in 1917. Over 500 letters were received from all over the country. Several letters came from California, and one from the SS Tuscania who heard the presentation far off Cape Charles, Virginia, in the Atlantic. It did not say so in the article, but you have to believe that this broadcast helped the growth of the Civitan during this time. The first WSY broadcast was on April 24, 1922, only two years after the first broadcast happened in the U.S. and England. The broadcast day probably started at 5 a.m. or so, so that early rising farmers would get the day's information. The announcer signed on. This is WSY, the radiophone broadcasting station of the Alabama Power Company, located at Birmingham, Alabama. To enable you to tune your instruments, we will now play a phonograph record selection. The announcer would then put a record on the Victrola, and the radiophone would pick up the music and broadcast it. Each day broadcast would also include featured news, market and farm reports, closing stock quotations, and a Bible discussion or an organ recital from one of the five churches that were hardwired to the station. There was also what you might call a talk show in the afternoon or early evening. It might be a well-known person or a celebrity passing through the state. Or maybe there was talk of what was happening at Alabama Power 
or an industrial topic. Music clubs from around the state were invited to play in the evening hours. Three days a week, the show would be broadcast with mainly the WSY Orchestra playing. The orchestra was made up of Alabama Power employees. All the players had to get used to the studio. Most were comfortable playing on a stage in front of a crowd. Now they had to play in the cramped confines of the WSY studio. One evening, a jazz band was featured, and they asked the listening audience what they would like to hear for an encore. Within minutes, the radio operator was inundated with requests from as far away as Michigan and southern Louisiana. They had to tell the audience to stop calling in as the switchboard was swamped. The studio was quickly replaced with an updated studio on the top floor of the four-story Loveman, Joseph, and Loeb's department store on 3rd Avenue North. It's where the McWayne Center is now. Experts on acoustics said it was the finest in the world. At least that was what the Birmingham News wrote. The station had a display window on street level that had a large map of the United States. On the floor of the display were letters from enthusiastic listeners and strings connected the letters to the location it came from on the map. In the fall of 1922, WSY made plans to broadcast the Southern Championship football game between Auburn and Georgia Tech that was being held in Atlanta. A special wire was run from Atlanta to Bernheim Electric Company in Birmingham and Neal Electric Company in Bessemer to receive constant updates. WSY had an announcer that understood the game of football and could take the terse telegraphic communications and recreate the game for the listener to hear. As the paper said, it will make the listener almost believe that he is following the ball with his own eyes. A month after the new studio was opened, a February ice storm shut Birmingham off from the rest of the world. Telephone and telegraph lines were down. All the newspaper presses were shut down, which is just as well since they couldn't get the AP and UPI wire service reports. WSY became the lifeline to the outside world by broadcasting news about what was happening in Birmingham, and they reported what was happening in the outside world to Birmingham citizens. The station even helped with personal issues. One woman got to her brother in Pittsburgh to make sure he got to their dying father's bedside, and they reached out to a visitor in Cleveland to let him know that his son died suddenly in Birmingham. The storm also allowed Alabama Power the opportunity to go back to the station's original mission. They were able to broadcast load dispatching to Anniston, Gadsden, and Warrior to coordinate the movement of linemen and construction crews to Birmingham. To help brand the station, WSY created a trademark featuring a Vulcan-type figure. Even though Birmingham's Vulcan had been cast in 1904 for the St. Louis World's Fair, the statue may have been at the Birmingham Fairgrounds and not looking over the city as the icon it is now. The WSY Vulcan was a Norse-looking figure with a winged helmet, striking an anvil with a hammer, and bolts of electricity shooting up. And this Vulcan seems to be wearing a full set of clothes. The slogan was, Service from the Heart of Dixie, Alabama's state nickname. An employee came up with the design in a contest and won $25 from Alabama Power President Martin. That's roughly about $385 today. At the end of the broadcast day, the sign-off would be, The anvil symbolizes the city of Birmingham, iron and steel working center of the South, and home of WSY. One stroke of the anvil stands for health, one for happiness, and the third for prosperity. All three Alabama gives in unlimited measure. Three slow strikes of the anvil followed. As the last one faded away, the announcer bade the audience good night. And it's hard to believe, but there was no advertising on WSY. The entire effort was undertaken as a public service. Alabama Power even invited every state chamber of commerce to come to promote their communities on the air. The popularity of the station was also the reason the company decided to shutter the station in late 1923. The publicity department was dedicating too much time to running the station and not enough time on other businesses of the company. When they realized that it was time to hire full-time talent for the station, that was when they knew it was time to get out of the radio business. President Martin felt the company's mission to pioneer radio broadcast in the South had been accomplished. The station stopped broadcasting on November 6, 1923, not even two years after the station signed on. Over 10,000 letters had been received from listeners during the short time of operation. About the same time that WSY was started, 
The Birmingham News donated money to help start a station at the Alabama Polytechnic Institute, now known as Auburn University. On February 21, 1923, WMAV went on the air. In January 1925, at the suggestion of Birmingham News publisher Victor Hansen, Alabama Power donated the WSY equipment to WMAV at Auburn. However, the equipment was already obsolete and of little use to them. Rather than disappoint their supporters, the college's Extension Service and Department of Electrical Engineering voted to purchase a modern transmitter, build two 200-foot towers, and outfit a studio on the third floor of Comer Hall. The new station was dubbed WAPI. All stations east of the Mississippi started with a W, and API stood for Alabama Polytechnic Institute. WAPI broadcast from Auburn until 1928 when it moved to Birmingham to take advantage of the large population and access to more on-air talent. The studios were located on top of the Protective Life Insurance Building on 20th Street and 3rd Avenue North, just one block from the last WSY studio at the Loveman's Building. By then, Birmingham had another radio station. Dr. J.C. Bell started WBRC, which stood for Bell Radio Corporation. Both WAPI and WBRC branched off into television stations in Birmingham decades later. WSY was started by the Alabama Power Company to stay in contact with their employees in remote locations, but they quickly found they could kickstart radio broadcasting in the South. They had the knowledge, they had the money, and they had the power. Pun intended. They also knew when it was time to get out and let others grow radio in Alabama. I hope you enjoyed this Alabama short story. If you enjoyed the story, do me a favor and tell one friend to give it a listen. You can subscribe to the podcast at Apple Music, Spotify, or wherever you prefer to listen to podcasts. See you next time at Alabama Short Stories.